This year also marks the centenary of the Communist Party of China, as you know. And this year will also make the CPC one of the longest serving ruling party in the world. Um, what do you think is the significance of that? I think that one has to look at this uh, anniversary um, in uh, some very important fundamental ways. First, in terms of legitimacy of political leadership and political power in a, in a big country, in, a, in, a, in an old civilization, uh, which China is. Uh, you see, the Communist Party has demonstrated something that political theorists call performance legitimacy. There is no doubt that life of people in China has improved enormously in the last decades. And of course, that was possible because the basis upon which such opening and accelerated development came in as a natural continuation. So one has to learn about legitimacy of state, legitimacy of political leaders in terms of results and performance. And that, there, I think the role of Communist Party of China is something special in, in global comparisons. In general, Chinese, the Communist Party of China was able to ensure its continued legitimacy of leadership. That's one thing. The other thing is mobilization. Uh, during COVID-19, we have learned uh, something about the capacity of China to mobilize its people. Now, some critics will say that this is too, um, uh, or should they say, too harsh or too difficult yeah, for a pluralistic Western society to, to do. Probably yes, but we should not underestimate the importance of the need to mobilize people when the needs arise. And we have to be prepared for future pandemics. So mobilization is another thing which I think we have to learn about when we talk um, uh, to, the, to the Chinese. So President Tork, you once remarked on, you know, the leading democratic system of the world, uh, saying that uh, they're really becoming the victims of their own complacency. Uh, they're falling into this confidence trap. Uh, why do you th say that? And do you think the COVID-19 situation is a case in point? The conclusion, or if you want, uh, theory of uh, the confidence trap is not mine. That comes from a British a political uh, analyst, political scientist, David Runciman, who wrote a whole book about the confidence trap and explained in great detail and with many historic examples of how democratic systems show vulnerability to complacency. They become, they become immersed and satisfied with the procedural aspects of democratic governance. And uh, plural, pluralism in the sense of a uh, multi-party system being an end in itself. And that, that actually can lead to a rather complacent view of democratic systems, and that creates what he called a confidence trap. Yeah, I agree. I think that he has uh, uh, presented a valuable and valid analysis of um, uh, democratic systems. And I believe that um, we have to think seriously about it. Now, he also said that uh, democratic systems have the necessary flexibility to move out of the confidence trap when they are caught in such a trap. So right now, I think the pluralistic democracies of the West are learning how it is to democratically manage the situation caused by mass infections produced by COVID. That's a new situation for, for, for the West. Let's talk about China model. Um, you know, China has been praised, of course, for its ability to alleviate uh, hundreds of millions of people out of poverty, you know, its economic growth and its delivery of public goods and services by its central and local governments over the years, and also its relative consistency in its foreign policy making, if you think about it. First of all, do you think there's such a thing as a China model? And if so, do you think the China model is perhaps rewriting the textbooks of uh, international um, political science? Well, I'm sure that there is something like um, development with Chinese characteristics, 
you know, China is a, is a large and old civilization. And uh, China cannot simply import a development model from somewhere else. China has to develop its own development model and then obviously interact with the rest of the world and uh, include whatever is helpful. Uh, so, I mean, the period of opening of China, which has started some 40 years ago, has been received from start as something very positive for the world. Now, some people believe that China will actually westernize. Uh, now, in my opinion, that was never an option. China is simply too large and too developed old culture to be completely westernized. It will be China, but it will include much of Western wisdom, I'm sure. And I think it would be useful if we in the West you know, could import some of the Chinese wisdom as well. So uh, will that have an impact on textbooks, on political science and other things? Sure it will, because um, the importance of Chinese model is going to be studied. I have recently read a very interesting book by a professor from Yale University in the United States by name of Daniel Mattingly, who wrote about governance of China. And it was very interesting that in the book, he makes comparisons between arrangements for development approaches, political systems, uh, how they actually work in various parts of the world, including, for example, the experiences from the United States, where certain patterns of governance in various recent periods were very similar to those that are applied in China. Now, that shows that models of development do influence each other or share some characteristics. But each of them remains its own. I mean, nobody would suggest that the United States should uh, kind of abandon the American way. And nobody should say that China should abandon the Chinese way.